All right, let me just make sure. Okay, I'm All right, got you, Mama Peggy. I can see that. Thank you for coming. <laughs> okay, I guess I can pray, or would anyone love to volunteer to pray? I guess you're it. All right. Good evening, Mama Diane. It's nice to see you after a while. <laughs> All right. Let's humble ourselves and pray. Mm -hmm. um, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come before you this day to thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for all that you've provided, Lord, for the roof over our heads, for food to eat, for good health, for clothing, Lord, for family, for things that we don't see, every miracle that just happens that we don't see, and even those that we do see, we say thank you. You've said in your word that where two or three have gathered there, you are in my midst, oh Lord. So we ask that even as we go for this Bible study and prayer meeting, that you will be with us, and you'll give us wisdom, and you'll help us to just glorify your name because at the end of the day, that's what we were created for, to bring you glory, oh Lord. Give us wisdom and may revelation be upon us, O Holy Spirit, that even as we continue to seek your face, we may learn to know you more and love you more and be able to show the love that you've shown us to others, O God, to overflowing. Thank you that you've had this prayer and let your name be glorified. In the name of Jesus Christ, we've prayed. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. Let's begin. So um, what we're going to do first is to open to the book of Hebrews. We're going to read the first four chapters and then we shall start the study from there. It should probably take about 30 minutes to 40 minutes, maybe 30 to 45 minutes. Just, um, just before we start the prayer meeting. So I'll be reading from the NASB, or would anyone like to read the first four chapters? I mean, I could read one chapter and then somebody could read another chapter. I'm just getting mine open. Okay, Hebrews, the first four chapters. I can help you read too. I'm just Sorry. Is that me? Yeah, that's okay. Um, who was that that said that you could help me read? Uh, I said I could help. Oh, all right. Let's go ahead. So you want me to start? Said, Someone else was help, helping too. Um, but if you want to, I can start. Yeah, I absolutely. could read too. Okay, so I guess that covers off. So you could do the first chapter and then um, someone else does the next chapter and someone the next chapter until all four chapters are done. If you don't mind me asking, what versions are we reading from? Because we could, we should, I think we could do the NASB. Does that work? NHB? Yeah, NASB. If that's okay. All right. Let me see. Uh, I have it in the NIV. I'm not sure what tr translation NHB is. No, NASB. Oh, duh. Sorry. My bad. <laughs> New American Standard, right? Right. Okay, do you want me to start since I'm such a big mouth? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay, please go ahead. Okay, so it says, um, Hebrews 1, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in the many portions in many ways, 
in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things through, through whom he also made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word, by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels to the extent that he has inherited a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have fathered you. And again, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And regarding the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But regarding his son, he says, your throne, God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of joy above your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands, and they will perish, but you will remain. And all and they all will wear out like a garment, and like a robe you will roll them up. Like a garment they will also be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. They are not all ministering spirits sent out in, to provide service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. Okay. I can do the second chapter if you can hear me okay. Yeah, absolutely, please. Okay. Warning to pay attention is what this one's titled. It says, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified, what is mankind that you are mindful of him, a son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at, his, at present, we do not see everything subject to them. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. But uh, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order 
that he may become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Okay. Two more chapters. Let's see. Okay, I'll just go ahead and read chapter three. I hope you can hear me, right? Sounds good. Okay. So chapter three, Jesus, our high priest, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, he was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was in all his house. For he has been counted worthy of many glory. Oh, sorry. My bad, sorry. For he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when you they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, while your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. The peril of unbelief. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil and believing heart that falls away from the living God but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ. If we hold fast the beginning of our assurance until the end, while it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Okay. Final I can read, but I don't have that version. I have the King James version. You want you want me to read, or you want someone else no. to? No, no, go ahead, please. Go ahead with that version. Okay, no, chapter okay. four. Okay, let us therefore fear, lest the promise be being left us. Yeah, thank you. I had to turn the light on. <laughs> Left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that hath that hear it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. And he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day, on this wise and God did rest 
the seventh day from all his work. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he la lameth a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time as it is said, today, if ye will hear his voice, pardon not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterwards have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore and enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a dissenter of thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any certain that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto his the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not, we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. All right. You're on mute, Rebecca. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that okay? Okay. Um, so I was just saying earlier how uh, <laughs> this came as a big surprise to me. You know, I had no idea that I could be asked to host a meeting. So I felt pretty terrified. But then, as you know, I asked Lord, if you've given me an opportunity to do this, then well, I need something to say. Um, you know, what would you want me to talk about? And this is what came to mind, you know, Hebrews 1 to 4. Because when we think about Hebrews, we talk about faith. And it's been a while now since we started our prayer meetings. And um, it's like, why don't we talk about faith? You know, this is something that just the Lord placed on my heart. And if we look to, if we look at chapter one, let's see. We, in fact, the particular verses that I had seen that really stand out. For example, verse nine, it says, "I'll now read from the NIV. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. The NASB, the NASB calls it lawlessness." Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. When I look at the oil of joy, I'm thinking, what does that mean? You know, we come to these prayer meetings and sometimes, yes, we are looking for prayer and everybody has a prayer request, but 
how about thinking about the joy of the Lord? Because sometimes that is actually an answer to prayer. And before I actually get to that, I'm, I'm curious, what do you think comes to mind when you hear that, that, you know, the oil of joy, what comes to your mind when you hear that? I'm thinking of something that you would put on to bring a different perspective, possibly. Like you, you put on oil, you know, you would put it on your skin. But if you put on the oil of joy, it's like you're putting on something that brings you a perspective of joy to take you out of the present situation of, of uh, mm -hmm. pain and sorrows. And oftentimes it, when we pray, we, uh, we do feel a lifting of weight off of us, all the, the problems of the world. And we start to realize that, uh, that God is all powerful and all the benefits that he brings to us that we really need to focus on because it's sometimes too easy to forget about these things in this, this world. Right. And what verse does that bring to mind? Mm, I can almost see it <laughs> and hear it, but, I, but it's not coming to me right now. Put on, put on the, what is it? Put on the joy of salvation for the spirit of heaviness, or is that a hymn? <laughs> you may have another one. Well, there's that one, but I, I don't know. I didn't, I, put, I didn't put that down as a reference, but there is that one. It would be good, actually, if you could remember the reference for that. It could be a song, is it? Is it a hymn? It could be. <laughs> I wouldn't just, then, that's what popped into my mind. <laughs> it's okay. Um, there is that verse where it says, the joy of the Lord is my strength, you know. And let's see, the reference for that is Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah. Let me just see if I got this right, because it should be Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Let me see if I just got that correct. Let me see. Okay. Yep. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. The joy of the Lord is my strength. There is that. Then... The other thing I want us to look at is Psalm chapter 23, verse 5. Psalm chapter 23, verse 5. There's something interesting I find about that Psalm because when I look at that Psalm, I'm thinking about Jesus. And there's just something about thinking about him, you know, as a shepherd, you know. So let's see, Psalm chapter 23, verse 5, it says, um, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. So having said that, when you look at verse nine, what that we're just reading, it says towards the end that um, uh, therefore God, your God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. So actually, those are three verses we've seen. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Yes, go ahead, brother iPhone. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to say about that verse is, uh, well, I agree totally with Fred. Um, it's like God is anointing you, an, anointing you with oil, kind of putting you aside, you know, as his. That's the way I see it. You know, when, when your oh. heart matches the way that um, God loves righteousness and hates iniquity. When we do that, uh, in, in my verse, it says, anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So to me, it's like, you know, mocking you as his because he sees your heart is with him. You know, that's just my opinion of it. But that, you know, that's... uh. The way I the way I look at it, absolutely. I totally you know, agree. and the and the big part there is he's anointing you with the oil. You know, it's not like you're putting the oil on yourself. You know that mm -hmm. the, what I really get out of that is God's putting the oil on you, saying, 
good my you know my son you know or whatever mm -hmm. you know right exactly that's so good and you know it's interesting because while he is putting that oil on you um it's interesting that also jesus was anointed with that same oil and with that being said galatians 2 20 comes to mind whereby it says that it is not i who live but christ who lives in you so you come to that point where you're like, you are Christ, you know, in a sense, in a manner of, of speaking, you are Christ. So you get anointed with the same oil that he was anointed with. I find that very interesting, you know, and um, surreal. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so and that's why I like the 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 chapters that you picked actually because it says more than once how you know Jesus went through what we go through. And that's why I really like those um chapters that you picked because it talks about that um you know Jesus going living on the earth and going through what we go through and then it works the other way as well. Like now if you can connect enough with God, you can really become like Jesus and live. Jesus can live through you. And, you know, you know, all things are possible with God. Right. So Amen. that that's that's beautiful. OK. OK. So now that's just chapter one. So let's see. Um, what else? What else um, was it? That is something you put in here. Uh -huh. All right. So now the next verse we're looking at is chap is verse 14, the last verse of that chapter. It says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Um who was it again that was reading in the KJV? I would like to hear what that says in KJV. Oh, that, that was me. Ch uh, verse 14? Yes, please. <clears throat> Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? I'm sorry. It's hard for me to read that. It's like, you know, different words. But did you get it? They are not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation i guess is that word is heirs yeah yeah okay no I, I got you i get it all right so now that's point number two the first point is that i wanted to make i guess with chapter one is that while we are entering prayer we're entering with a with the oil of joy the same oil that anointed jesus the same i mean you are practically jesus Although I don't want to get ahead of myself, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, but you're entering into the place, you know, the throne of grace as though you are actually Jesus himself interceding and praying for you, for others, and you're entering with the oil of joy. That's point one. So you have assurance with that joy that, you know, that, that joy gives you strength and you have the strength to pray for whatever it is that you have need of or to pray for somebody else. Now that's just the first point. The second point is, you know that what you ask for, you have been answered because the angels are there listening. They're practically sent to serve you and not to serve, of course, in the sense that, um, you know, you do my bidding, <laughs> in that kind of thinking, no, but, they're listening, so they're carrying out God's commands as you pray. Yeah, somebody wanted to say something? No? Oh, okay, I thought I had someone who wanted to say, say something. And then um, the angels are doing as you are praying according to God's will. There's a verse in James that we're looking at in the last Bible study about how we pray and we pray amiss because we pray with wrong motives. The one way that you can pray without having the wrong motives is to pray using God's word. You know, 
you pray using the word of God. Uh, Miss Yolanda, are you okay? Have you, have you said that out? You okay? Sorry about that. I hope it's working. All right, so, okay. So I was just saying that um, you pray according to God's word and the angels carry out what God's word says because they are listening. So what I like to do sometimes is actually pray the Psalms, you know, when I have nothing to say, that's what I pray. And um, you can't go wrong with praying God's word. You can't because while you use your own words to pray, sometimes you maybe, I wouldn't want to say that you're praying the wrong prayer. No, you cannot pray a wrong prayer because it's the heart that matters. But just the fact that you're praying God's words, it's like, I don't want to say you're reminding him because you, he knows everything, but you're saying what he's saying. And the Bible does say that God's word does not return void. So if God's word does not return void, then that means someone is carrying it out. And that's where the angels come in. Yes, God will answer prayer, but they are there listening, the angels, you know, to your prayer. And, you know, I just imagine them going before God and saying, you know, just like the book of Revelations, you know, as we are doing in homework, the angels were carrying, what is it? The incense, was it incense of the prayers of um, the saints? You know, so they are there. And that's chapter one. So in chapter one, there are two points. One, the oil of joy. Two, the angels are there ministering and, and you know, serving and waiting to carry out God's will. So you have no doubt that your, hair, that, that your prayers are just hitting the roof. No, they go beyond that. God is hearing, God is answering, God is there. He's omniscient, omnipresent, and all those other big words. <laughs> you know, big, why? Because you're an heir of salvation. The Bible says in Romans 8 that we're heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And by the spirit, we call our father. So you know that what you're praying for is actually answered. So now that's chapter one. Chapter two. Hmm. Um, I want us to focus on the first verse in particular. Let's see. First one and verse two. Two, it says, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just, um, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Okay, so I continue to verse four because of, um, I just want, I just like the whole context. I'm reading from the NIV again. And um, I guess what I just really want us to see is the importance of keeping in mind everything that the Bible says. Sometimes it's hard to forget that maybe it says that by faith, this and this can happen, or by faith, this and this can happen, you know, because Hebrews is practically the whole of faith. So you want to learn about faith, you go to Hebrews, and you get to see how people live their lives. It doesn't mean they got their answers in one day, but faith gives you hope. You can see it, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel, but you have to remember what he said because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And that's Romans 10, 17. So in, I would say in a nutshell, let's see um, if we could mark verse one of chapter two, verse eight and verse 11, as well as verse 14, because there are four points there. One, eight, 
11 and 14. So um, let's see, let me just go to verse eight. Actually, from verse seven, you made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might test death for everyone. Now that part talks about how Jesus has overcome and if Jesus has overcome, so have you. I don't know, does anybody else have anything to add to that verse? Because I still see how it goes back to Galatians 2.20, you know? Um, before I go to that, maybe, oh, um, does anyone have anything else to say? Maybe just to add on like what stands out to you from verse eight and verse seven. Anybody? No one? I think it's pretty powerful overall. I mean, it, sometimes we read over these things and we don't just stop and fully digest them, but everything under, everything is, is under uh, Jesus. I mean, and we look back and he, he was part of the creation too. So it all belongs to him. And uh, he suffered death for us. So you just think about that humiliating experience. And yet he did it for us because he loves us so much. That just that just kind of hits me in the heart. He, it mm. says here, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. That's it just it really it, it hits home with me that here is God's son that really did this for us. And uh, we are so undeserving, but he loved us so much. And uh, now we can, as we said earlier, we can actually partake in uh, so many things he did for us, like the, the uh, oil of joy. So uh, that's, that's something that stands out to me. Absolutely. Because I think, I think you're absolutely right. Because one word I, I really just want us to focus on is the word rest. From chapter one, it's the one thing you keep seeing, but that rest didn't come just like that. <laughs> I don't know if you have the same saying um, in the West, but um, there's a saying that goes, um, it's kind of off point, but it goes something like money doesn't grow on trees or something like that, or it didn't fall from the sky, you know, so in the same way, that rest didn't just grown trees or fall from the sky he had to pay the price for that rest he had to pay the price for us to be able to enter the presence and be able to talk to god you know and be able to have that relationship with god but the question is what is that rest that we're talking about to the point that you're able to enter prayer and have that rest you know, it's not just rest in the sense of peace of mind. It's something else. And we're going to get to that. So Galatians 2.20 again, it is not you who live, but Christ who lives in you. You know, rest comes from the fact that, <laughs> well, I almost said it, but I'll get to that later. <laughs> and then um, let's see, verse 11 says that both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers in the presence of the congregation. I will sing your praises. That is verse 11, verse 12. So first, the first point in chapter two was the fact that we cannot forget what the word of God says because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. It's important to remember what God's word says when you enter the praying room, when you enter the secret place, it's important to remember what God's word says. Always have it, I mean, at the forefront because you cannot pray amiss if you have God's word, that's one. Two, there was a price that Jesus paid for us to be able to enter that presence. 
and we have the authority. So I could dare say that let's not misuse that authority by forgetting the fact that he paid the price. What do I mean? Sometimes you enter the praying room or we enter into prayer and while we know that Jesus died for us, we don't remember or we forget to use the authority that he has given us or we don't find ourselves worthy enough to use that authority. Or we simply just don't know how to use it. But that being said, we have, with, with this lesson, you know, you know, I just want us to know that um, we have the authority when we enter the praying room. But to always keep in mind that there was a price that was paid for that authority. That's one within that verse, you know. We have that authority because it's not us who live, but Christ who lives in us. And then point number three, we are part of his family. Romans 8 again, by his spirit, we can cry, Abba, Father, we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. You know, we have Jesus Christ rooting for us. We have him, I mean, he's done it all. And all we have to do is just be a part of his family so that we can have those privileges of being able to enter the presence of God without having to sacrifice animals or I don't know it says come as you are come as you are I don't think he ever expects us to be perfect in terms of um you know <laughs> be be good you know we're learning about how we are perfect in Christ but there are times where we fall short and we feel we cannot enter the presence. You know, that's what I'm saying. But you have the opportunity because you are part of God's family. And then there's verse 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shed in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Mm -hmm. I'll just stop there and say, I don't know. Wait, if I get to that, what does death mean to you? As in, when you hear that word death, exactly what comes to mind? To me, I think it, it means it's a finality, like that's it, we're done. And I think so many people are afraid of it because it's unknown to them, but they, it's in a way I look at it, like it's a spiritual death. Like there is no more. Uh, it could even me when, when it, when it mentions uh, the devil that we are subjected to some very bad things and uh, people are afraid of that, but to know that uh, we're saved from that, that we are freed is, is very powerful and gives us a whole new perspective on life and, pretty much makes us not fear death like like the world typically fears death hmm. mm -hmm. okay well yes there is a death where you are afraid of life that ends with the body you know but there is life after that you know just like you're saying however there is more to death I do believe that there is this point where something, when something bad happens, that's almost like death, you know, maybe when somebody falls sick or when somebody loses a loved one or when somebody, um, I don't know, I guess something bad happens to you. In a sense, I would say that that is death because you, you sometimes you get a sense of despair, you know, as in this verse talks about death in the sense of um yes life being lost from the body but death is more than that it's it's definitely deeper than that there's that perspective that you can give it whereby when you really think about it it's like everything is somewhat touched by death one way or another it could be you know just as i said it could be losing a loved one or something bad happens to you you falling sick that means actually you falling sick you could say it's maybe somewhat maybe has death happened to the body 
you know, I'm just posing this, you know, just as a question, you know, just to give that depth to that kind of thinking of death. And this is why I'm saying this is, I just want us to know that Jesus really did overcome. He is life and he overcomes every single part of death. Yes, please go ahead, Brother Ivan. Yes, I think, um... You, you know, you, you're right. Like when I read that to me, it's like to think that death in this body on earth is the end is basically like not having faith in, in believing what the devil wants you to believe, you know, like you should, we should, as Christians look at that as a new beginning, you know, as of course there's life after death, but so many people fear death because they're not sure what happens when you die, you know, but um, I think that's what he's trying to say here is that's the way the devil wants it. And I want, I want you better than that. You know, I want you to know, and I want you to have faith. That's what, you know, gives you that life after death is faith ultimately. And um, yeah, that's the way I see that, you know, destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil you know Mm -hmm. uh so yeah yeah i agree with everything fred said and and you said but i just wanted to add that um a little bit because i think it's so easy to think like that because that's the way the world thinks right when somebody dies oh that's it you know they're they're Mm -hmm. gone you know and they're not gone and nothing, you know, I've learned that lo- losing loved ones. Yeah, they're gone from here, but nothing has changed. Your relationship with them is exactly the same as it was when you, when they were alive, you know, and when you speak of them, if you love them, you should speak happily of them and you should, you know what I mean? And I don't know. I'm, now I'm just starting to talk, but um i hope you get what i'm saying <laughs> you, know, like, <laughs> you know your relationship you say your mother dies she's still your mother you love her just like she was when she was alive you know and in that relation you will i believe you will see them again um you know and and and, and this is these are just tricks of the devil to make you think that it's over or something like that and you really have to not have any faith to think that way, but, uh, that's, that's the way the world wants it. That's the way the devil wants it. So we have to really guard over that, you know, we have to know better, we have to know better. Okay. Absolutely. Definitely. Totally agree. (laughs) Um, I like this. Um, let's see, what did I write here? Okay. So um, Jesus has overcome death in every sense of the word, every sense of the word. I think our, our one prayer should definitely be that, Lord, everybody in my family, everybody anywhere that I know, people need to know you so that they don't miss out on life after death, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then, um, so yeah, I think that covers chapter two. Now, I know that I'm skipping some, um, I guess, the bulk of much of what we read, but um, I do that because I I, I just wanted us to read the whole because of context. So we're not, we have a background why, you know, we have these small points, you know, why we're picking out particular points, you know, as we prepare to enter into a time of prayer. But yeah, death is not the end. And it's amazing to think that Jesus Christ put on flesh so that he could conquer that, cover death. I mean, he has the keys. And if he has the keys, then so do we. Actually, you could think of it as we have conquered death because he has conquered death. So when I'm entering my prayer room, I have conquered death. Hmm. Interesting. 
by the way, as I'm speaking, I'm learning. <laughs> oh yes, Mama Diane, please go ahead. So there's just, as we're reading through this, there's this um, thread of divine power, the divine power with the oil, being anointed with the oil of gladness and uh, the authority that we have. And when, uh, when he was talking, he said the power of death, and it made me think about, um, wow, you know, that fear of death, it, it really does have a power to it. Um, mm -hmm. That uh, anybody awake the last several years have watched how people have been manipulated by that power of dying, the fear that it, that they were um, instilling in the, in the news media, shall we say. Uh, it, it does have a power to it, to motivate people to do things that, without faith. And how our faith is the thing that gives us that knowledge that we have the power over that. So still part of this thread, still part of the thread about divine power. You know? Yay. Absolutely. Totally. I so there's a freedom. There is a freedom yeah, okay. there. I, I agree ahead. with, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It's all right. I'm sorry here, Aubrey. But I think what Diane was saying, I totally, her, her point is really good and applicable to what we've seen in the past few years. Um, it, it fits exactly with verse 15 and free those, uh, all their lives who were held in slavery by their fear right. of death. Right. So I mean, that, that really hits home here with, with that exactly. And uh, those of us who have salvation don't have that fear. And, and as a matter of fact, I, I know people that when they come to the end of their life and they're saved, and some of them actually even look forward, say, I'm going to a better place. I'm going to leave all these problems and this body with all its problems. And uh, they look forward to it with a joyous expectation of being in heaven with Jesus. But mm. uh, that's it's something, and, and I, you know, I, I just want to make sure and clarify something here. Those that don't have Jesus don't have that salvation to look forward to. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't mm -hmm. know that we're going to see them again, except maybe, you know, maybe if, if we're going to uh, uh, sit on a, you know, sit with God on a judgment seat, is it possible we'll, we'll see them there and they'll get their, their justice? But I, we're not going to see them in heaven anymore, right? Because they don't have salvation, the ones that are not saved. Mm. but and that's why i mean when you think about that that's even motivation for us to want to tell as many people you exactly. know our friends and family, right mm -hmm. that's sobering hmm. that's sobering and you know it's hard especially when you see a lot happening around you to not um focus on that negativity that is negativity at the end of the day. Oh, brother iPhone, please go ahead. Sorry, I hadn't seen you. <laughs> yeah, just one more thing. Um, you know, I really like what Diane said as well. And uh and just another to clarify, like it's incredible that we can talk like this because mm -hmm. you know it that it's all true, <clears throat> but it's it shouldn't be, you know, it should be the end when we die. But thanks to Jesus, it's not. So it's just important yeah. to remember that as well, right? It's all a gift from God. And, you know, amen to that. So it's just important to remember, keep that in the forefront of the mind that, uh, well, we can be sin-free with Jesus. None of us deserve this, you know, because we all have sinned. And if it wasn't for Jesus, we wouldn't deserve this, you know? So that's uh, just important to, it makes it, just even more awesome you know amen yeah that puts a smile on my face <laughs> i don't know why i guess i'm looking forward to this i mean can you imagine having bible study in heaven i don't know what that will look like but well <laughs> well um uh well um well where were we so yeah verse 14 and then verse 15 and then that covers chapter two so what did we look at in chapter two? I'm sorry, was someone saying something? No? Oh, okay. Yeah, you guys so, should please mute if you're not talking because there is some background, background noise. 
okay all right um so yeah that covers chapter two um the first point was don't forget what you heard what you read in the bible what did god say number two know that there is authority you have authority when you enter the praying room you have the authority because he has the authority and he paid the price for it so don't misuse the authority you have by not using it hmm. and then number three we are part of this family so if i am a child of god then i have to act like it and use what i have you know because i'm part of his family and you know we are heirs of god and co-heirs with christ and then number four he's conquered death you have authority over every single aspect of death and you have no reason to fear remember hebrews is all about faith and remember ali i said rest what is rest the idea of rest a lot of that is tackled in hebrews especially the first few chapters and we're getting to that so <clears throat> chapter three starts with, um, therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. He was faithful to the one who appointed him just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. So fix your thoughts. When you're entering prayer, who are you focusing on? God, you are focusing on, let's see, yeah. Fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and the priest when they confess. Actually, the more you read of chapter three, or you, as you know, you go ahead, actually in chapter four, you read about how he's a priest in the order of Melchizedek, and then how we are also a royal priesthood. I don't know why, but for some reason that still reminds me of Colossians 2.20. It seems to be that we are a lot more that, than we think we are. We are more than conquerors because he's more than a conqueror. So if we think and remember that he is the priest, then we are priests as well. We are a royal priesthood. And you enter the presence of God remembering that fact. You know, you are like Christ in every aspect of the word because you have him in your heart. That's the one. And then a few verses later, verse 11. Now this is why it gets interesting because this is what I really wanted us to look at, the rest. Now, we have been reading so far, you know, just the background of how you approach God and maybe what to remember, what to do, the good reminders of approaching God. But then there's always that, how do you call it? A disclaimer, you know? That's why I kept saying, just rest, remember rest. And what is rest? So when we look at chapter um, three and then we go to verse seven, it talks about warning against unbelief. Unbelief is the enemy of prayer. I mean, you can pray and pray and pray however much you want to, but if you don't have belief, if you don't have faith, it's like you nullify your prayers. Your posture actually after you pray is extremely important because it proves or it shows if you really believe what you prayed for, if you really believe that you got what you prayed for, you know. So it is a recurring theme of faith in chapter three, you know, how, how the Israelites missed out, for example, on the promised land. Hmm, these guys had everything going for them. They had God leading them by cloud in the day and by fire at night. He gave them Moses. I mean, God, okay, I could say in a sense, God was tangible. Even though it was through Moses, God was tangible. But they missed out on having that relationship with God. You see, let me see if I can 
just read what I wrote for you here. So in my journal, what I wrote for chapter three was that in chapter three, I had found a recurring theme of faith and how the Israelites missed out on the promised land, you know, because of their unbelief. If you remember in, in the book of Numbers, we read about how Moses sends the spies to, you know, check out the land, you know, scout, go see what's there, what can we do? Where do we begin? What is it like? What type of people live there? But they came back with a bad report. Well, the majority of them did. And while two had faith that God could help them conquer the land, it was theirs. The other 10, the other ten did not. And I think when you think about how bad unbelief is, what did Jesus say? You believe in God, believe also in me. It's very important to God how you believe, when you believe, you know, goodbye, Mama Peggy. <laughs> All right, so it's very important to God when you believe because um, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Read that in the book of Hebrews, you know, sorry, the chapter, chapter 11, verse six. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And when you read verses like that, it reminds you of how important it is to actually have faith in God. I don't know if you remember, at one point we did a Bible study where we were talking about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And Auntie Edmund gave us this um, perspective whereby the reason why Jesus wept was not really per se because of um, Lazarus. <laughs> it was because he was sad and this people is, you know, he's gone there with so much vigor, you know, let's believe, let's believe. And then here he comes and they're so full of unbelief. They don't really think that God can do, you know, <laughs> what he had, you know, raising the dead and all of that. And it made him sad. And you read at the end of that chapter that he walked away. And that was an interesting perspective because I was like, my gosh, I'd never seen it like that that it's so important to God, the fact that we believe. But unbelief is so bad that it's equated to disobedience. Let's see, we can look at that in verse, well, we can start at verse 11. He says that he declared an, an oath in his anger that they, they would never enter his rest. Mm -mm. And what was that? It was the promised land. The promised land is a place or was a place where these people could have relationship with God. It was a place where they could be one with God. The Shema says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. For you to be able to repeat that as a reminder over and over again, you had to be at a point where it's not just words that you're speaking. You actually know who your God is. You know how different he is from others around, you know, all the other people around and their gods and the kind of lifestyle they had. But the Israelites are so stiff-necked that their unbelief kept them from the land. They, it kept them from enjoying the promised land. That was the rest. But it gets deeper than that. Um, somebody's on can you mute oh, I... okay that's okay all right so let's see if you move to fast 16, we are faced with questions or best, actually it could start from verse 15, but as has just been, just one moment, we have come to show in Christ if we will come into the end, the confidence we had at first. Okay, so as has just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. That's when the Israelites, you know, rebelled and they wouldn't enter the promised land because of their unbelief. So who were they who had and who heard and rebelled? 
So now this was what I was saying in chapter one. Remember what God said. You heard, but rebellion is equated with unbelief or vice versa. Unbelief is equated with rebellion. That's how God, how seriously God takes unbelief. And, you know, in the gospels, you read about this man who was, um, what a son who was convulsing. And, you know, Jesus he talks to him about unbelief and he says, Lord, help me overcome my unbelief. So that shows you how serious it is. You know, were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt and with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest if not those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter. Why? Because of their unbelief. So that shows you how serious unbelief is to the point that it's equated to disobedience, to rebellion. Be careful that your unbelief causes you to miss out on God's greatest blessings. Because I wouldn't want, <laughs> I think it's like a child. You, as a child, a child trusts in their parent for everything. Especially when you're really, really young, if you told a child anything, they believe everything. I mean, they never doubt. <laughs> I mean, what you said is what you said. But there comes an age where the child begins to doubt. Hmm. Mm -mm. I don't think so. I don't think so. And at some point, you'll find that because a child is going into their own person, they, they begin to develop their own character and their own personality. And suddenly, <laughs> parents and children are clashing. It might not be in a bad way, no, but this is a, this is a person or a child that has become their own person. I say this because, you know, these people, instead of being children of God, you know, this is why it's important to have childlike faith. I think, I think somebody was saying that, was it on the group chat? I think somebody was saying that, I think on the group chat about childlike faith, childlikeness. Anyway, I, I could be wrong, but yeah, childlikeness. It's important to remember to be like a child when you're approaching God. Unbelief is horrible. It's terrible. You miss out on entering the promised land because of unbelief. You miss out. Remember, rest. Rest is the promised land. So it goes deeper than that again. Why did God really want this people to go to the promised land? I mean, there has to be a reason. It wasn't just about the land, right? It wasn't just about getting his people to enter that place, but I'm really just, I'm just curious. What do you guys think? Why did God really want these people to enter the promised land? Well, I think we, uh, we learned why he chose Israel, the Israelites, you know, to be God's people so that um, the whole world didn't become like Sodom and Gomorrah. So it didn't really matter that they didn't all believe. Well, you know, of course he wanted them all to believe, but it, as long as some of them did, there was hope for the future, you know, but um, I don't know. That's just what come, comes to my mind right there. Um, I don't know if that's really the answer that you were looking for, but, uh, <laughs> you know, there. <laughs> but what I want to know is why did he want them to enter the promised land? Why the promised land? Okay, why? I mean, they could have lived anywhere or he could have chosen any other place or, okay, let me put, let me say it like this. He could have just left them in Egypt, but why did he want them to have the promised land? Why the promised land? to uh, like separate them out from the rest of the world to have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a God's people. Mm -hmm. And what would you call that? Uh, 
Um, what do I call it? Well, I think it's the beginning of the church, you know, the beginning of. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. Mm -mm. Chosen people. Yes, they're the chosen people. But what I'm is asking, why did he send them? To, why the promised land? What was he looking for to send them to the promised land? He could have left them in Egypt or in the desert, but they did eventually enter the promised land. So why? Maybe let's start with John 17, 3. Who'd want to read John 17, 3? The Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 3. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, but it's deeper than that. To be an example of the, to the rest of the world. Yeah, but it's deeper than that why it is true all of these things that you're saying are true but why did he really want them to enter the promised land yes they're going to be they are the chosen people yes they are to be examples yes totally but why did he send them to the promised land or why did he lead them to the promised land or why did he separate them to be in the promised land i'll say this i don't know if it's right but um also, he did it so they could, he brought them out of Egypt so that they could worship as he wanted them to. And has, uh, so I think that has something to do with it. So they so could worship he, God the way that he wanted them to and to be free to do it, to okay. praise God the right way. Okay, so what was God doing in sending them to worship him? or separate them to worship him. Or he, okay, yeah, he wanted them to worship him the right way and you know, to glorify him and all. But what was he really trying to do? Maybe John 17, chapter three will help. Um, is it John chapter 17, verse three? Okay, I got it, relationship. He wanted them to exactly. have that relationship with him by worshiping exactly. them freely. You know, he's not going to make you do it. It's going to be you free to worship, but he wanted to build that relationship. Say, look, it, exactly. you're my people. Here's your land. You come and you worship God. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to get close. We're going to build a relationship. Yes. Yes. That's it. That's exactly it. It's all about relationship. You know, John 17, verse 3 talks about how that they may know. Let's see, it says, now this is eternal life, that they may know Jesus Christ, that they may know, sorry, that they may know God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So we know that there's a, um, a recurring theme of faith in chapter 3 and really throughout the whole of Hebrews. But we're confronted with this issue of unbelief. And the Israelites seem to have had a big problem with unbelief. And the reason why God equated the unbelief with disobedience is that they failed to realize that all he ever wanted was relationship. They didn't really want a relationship with God. It's like they wanted God for what he could give them. And you see that a lot in the book of Judges. Everybody did as they pleased, you know. When things became bad, suddenly, oh God, please help us, remember us, please, we are never gonna do this again. No, 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 we can't, we don't know, and, and so on and so forth. Then God relents and you know helps them out of the situation, but just as soon as they're out of it, they forget. The, the Israelites failed to realize the importance of relationship with God. And that equated to unbelief. Because that means they rejected God. I don't know if that makes sense. I hope I'm making sense. Does it make sense? I hope I'm making sense. The promised land was all about relationship. Right now we're talking about rest. He rejected, you see, Hebrews chapter three says, um, just a moment, let me just get back to it. It says, so we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. 
And the previous verse says, and to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? Hmm? If not to those who disobeyed. Okay, that's good. I'm glad it makes sense. So if God told the Israelites to turn back into the desert for 40 years, he was actually, yes, of course, all the, um, all those people died, but they died because of their unbelief. You know, things were so much to a place whereby God didn't want people of unbelief to be entering the promised land. A relationship with God requires you to have faith. That verse, there's a verse that says, oh my gosh, I forgot to write it down. Um, if we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord, then we are saved. You cannot have a relationship with God without believing that he actually exists, without believing that he's real, that he's tangible, even if you can't see him. It takes faith to believe in something you have never seen. And the Israelites failed to realize that, but yet they had visuals, the cloud leading them, the fire at night. I mean, Moses in the presence of God, you know, you know, Moses would come out of the presence with such a glowing face that he would have to cover it with a veil. They could see, yet they would not believe. And so, you know, they're about to enter the promised land. 10 are in unbelief, two have faith. And God, say, and God says, okay, this just won't do. You'll have to just <laughs> go. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying he was happy about all them dying in the desert, but I really do believe that it was a chance for some of those people to have some faith. But even during those 40 years, you find a lot of conflict. These people are really stiff necked, you know? And so that generation dies, and then you have this new generation, and then you have Joshua leading this new generation and telling them, you have to do this, you have to do this, and this, and this. And, you know. But the, at the root of it all, is faith in God because faith in God brings relationship. You have to believe that he exists. So all of that to say really, that's how serious unbelief is to God. You cannot enter God's presence with unbelief because how then will you get your prayers answered? I mean, then it becomes pointless because faith is what is the evidence of things hoped for and is it the substance of things not seen. I hope I've said that right. Again, Hebrews 11, is it? yeah, Hebrews 11. You have to believe that what you have prayed for is actually answered. The promised land was all about relationship. And if you want to have a relationship with someone, you have to trust them, you have to have faith in them. You know, we are one with God. Now, that being said, we move to verse, no, this is now chapter four, the full explanation of rest. Remember that in, fact, in chapter three, we have been told that they did not enter God's rest because of their unbelief. So, in chapter four, we read, therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Hmm. Um, uh, okay, what I have here right now is a NIV, and I can't seem to open my NSB. So I was hoping if somebody could read that for me, please, the first verse. I just wanted to hear what it says. Uh, Hebrews 4 1 in it's okay KGV or NSB I just want to hear it in a different version okay I'll read it let us therefore fear less the promise yeah the promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it any okay. of you should seem to come short of it yes Okay. You want me to read it again? Did you get it? Just go over it again, just one more time. 
Okay, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. Any of okay. you should seem to come short of it, yes. Okay, that's good. Thank you. You're welcome. We have this opportunity to enter the rest of God. You know, in our own way, we have our own promised land. But what are you doing about it? I mean, life passes us by every day. <laughs> I'll give this example. I recently traveled. Um, um, okay, so right now I am in Uganda. And, but previously, when we were doing the Bible studies, I was in Rwanda. Now, Rwanda is one hour behind Uganda. So right now it is 2.23 a.m. Okay, but time here for some reason, when I was in Rwanda, because of the time, time seemed to be moving slow. I don't know if, I, if I'm making sense, but it was moving slower than it is here because everything is happening so fast. When I came here, I just had so much to do and so many places to go. And I, I had, I mean, work to do, people to see, you know, cause it had been years since I had come back and really been able to just settle properly. So now what I noticed is that my mind is still stuck in Rwandan time. I can't seem to think outside of that time. And so when I look at the clock, I'm expecting it to be three o'clock, maybe let's say, Okay, no, let's say 4 p.m. But suddenly I'm like, why is time moving so fast? Yet it is supposed to be 3 p.m. You see, because if you don't have a moment to stop and rest, you just find time flying. You won't have, how do I say this? You won't have, um, just those moments to stop and think. And that's something that I've really had to work on. I found myself getting to a point where I was even struggling to do my own personal devotions because I'm so caught up in how, I was so caught up in how things used to be and I'm, forget, I'm forgetting where I am. And while it is good, yes, you, you know, you have to be able to adjust to, a different environment. You have to learn to be flexible, but time with God is extremely important. You have to prioritize your time with God. You cannot go through life without it. It's so important. It's like breathing air. It's your life. I, I don't know if I, should I call it life support? I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but it's so important to find a moment where you rest in the presence of God. You need it for survival in this crazy world. Don't be found. It says, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. You have a chance, you know, and okay, maybe that was what I was saying, particularly because of prayer time. But then again, this first verse applies to many of those who don't know the Lord. We have a chance to tell them about the Lord so that they can also enter his rest, so that they can also enter the promised land, which is relationship with him. The promised land is relationship with God. The place where the Israelites denied or rejected God, that is a promised land. We have to tell people about that, but they also have a choice, you know, to enter the promised land, just like the Israelites did, just like we all have had it. Don't be found to have fallen short of, of the Lord's rest, of the promise that he has given you, because to reject the promised land is to reject God. If you remember, we just read John 17, three, that eternal life is to know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Eternal life is to know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Eternal life is to know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. 
So if eternal life is to know God, what did the Israelites really reject in the promised land? When they rejected God, what were they rejecting? Can, anyone can go ahead and answer that. Let's see. Exactly. You said it, eternal life. They were rejecting eternal life. So they entered the promised land. Well, those that missed out in the promised land, they rejected the promised land, which was a relationship with God, which really, if you really want to talk about relationship, it's knowing God. You cannot have a relationship with someone that you don't know. That is not a relationship. It becomes something else. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, it becomes what, a, an acquaintance or, a, I mean, I don't even know what to call that, but it's not a relationship. You need to know someone to have a relationship with God or to have a, sorry, to have a relationship with them rather. You need to know. So in other words, these people missed out on the promised land, on rest, which is the promised land, which is relationship with God because of their unbelief. So in essence, they actually rejected eternal life. They rejected God who is eternal life because John 17, three says eternal life is to know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Hmm. So in other words, what we're saying is knowing God is eternal life. Isn't that interesting? Eternal life is not just about living long. No, it's more than that. It's knowing God. I'm just imagining, you know, I die, or in the words of Jesus, I fall asleep <laughs> and I'm in heaven. I mean, we've gone past the whole judgment and standing before God. And, you know, yes, my name is in the book of life. We've gone past all that, but I don't know God. I mean, um, you're just living with a stranger, basically. And I believe, I think, I dare say there are going to be people like that who entered heaven. That while it, let me say, while it is good to accept Jesus Christ, you want to make sure you spent your whole life actually living for him and getting to know him even better. Because there are those who are just going to accept him last minute, but they will have missed out on a life of knowing God. They will have missed out on a great opportunity to actually have lived for him and done amazing things, amazing things for him. So when they get to heaven, what do they have to show for their acceptance of Jesus Christ? You know, for their salvation, it will just be, I don't know, for lack of a better of saying it, it will just be by word of mouth. Okay, I accepted Jesus Christ and I believe in my heart, but it was last minute. You didn't get that opportunity to be nice to someone, to help somebody in need. I don't know, to um, feed somebody who was hungry, pray for the sick, raise the dead. You didn't get an opportunity to live that life. And I really think that that is what this verse means. You enter the rest of God, means you've entered the promised land, means you have entered relationship with God, and it means you have eternal life, which is to know God. But if you just know God from the point that you accepted Jesus Christ and then you died, that's all you, you have. Yes, you've believed, but that's all you have. You actually don't have any kind of, you have nothing to say that I did this and this for you. And I find that very sad. You will enter heaven, but do you really know God? Have you, you don't have, um, it's like you've been meeting someone for the first time and you won't be able to say, you know, daddy, I did this. You know, like how a child brings home their school paper with their grades, I got an A and they're so proud. 
you won't have that. And just goes back to how important it is, as Mr. Fred and Brother iPhone, Mama Diane was saying, the importance of knowing God. Uh, uh, you know, you want to be able to be at that point where you're, you know who your father is. There is no point of living this life without really getting to build that relationship with God. Life becomes meaningless because you are created to glorify God. So if you're not doing that, then life is meaningless, honest. I don't know. Would anybody want to add anything to that? I don't know what stands out to you, something, anything. I, I know with me, a lot of things stand out and it, it really impresses me to think that we get closer to God and get to know his heart. I know uh, Sister Edme was talking about that one of her missions is to show us God's heart. And that's really important. And we're, we're seeing it here and what he desires for us. A thought came to me, too, when we were talking about the promised land, that in some ways, you know, we, we were talking about the promised land and relationship. But in some ways, it seems like a restoration to go back to the Garden of Eden when, when mm. God had Adam and Eve there and they were there for a relationship with him. So it was almost like he wanted to take the Israelites back to that time, take them back to a safe area and have a, a real good relationship with them. But uh, it touches my heart to think about this more, that uh, how important it is uh, for a relationship with God and his desires for us. Because uh, sometimes we just think of the Christian faith of things that we have to do um, and uh, certain, I want to say, mission type work. But uh, this we, we can easily miss the fact that God wants a relationship with us. And it's so very important mm -hmm. in this scripture. So. That stands out to me and it, it makes an impression on me. So it's uh, just thank you for pointing that out. Right. You're welcome. You know, as I'm saying all these things, I'm also speaking to myself because these are things that we tend to forget. Like I was saying, oh, yeah, time passes you by. I'm still trying to adjust the time here. <laughs> but I'm not happy that I'm struggling to have my devotional life in order because that's that's my top priority it has to always be you don't want to go through life without relationship mm -mm. you don't want to live like how this guy this um the israelites lives they rejected god and in 40 years they were all gone I don't even want to think about how those people faced God. I don't want to think about that because they had a chance. They had that evidence, tangible evidence, meanwhile, that God was real. But their unbelief kept them from the promised land. I think there's one thing we have to pray for is for God to help us overcome our unbelief. I don't know, actually, I don't know if you've read that scripture where um, Jesus says um, that same verses are saying in the gospels about how the man prays, please help me overcome my unbelief. In that same chapter, Jesus says, tells his disciples that this kind come out only by prayer and fasting. You know, he wasn't even talking about the demon. He was talking about the issue of unbelief. And I don't know, I, I don't know how I can explain that, but sometimes you see in the versions that we read, and you know, this is actually something I learned from Auntie Edme, that this was actually about unbelief. It was not even about the demon. You want to increase in prayer and become better at it, then ask God to help you overcome your unbelief. Even fast and pray for it, because faith as small as a mustard seed can move mountains. So the message they had, if you move, if you see actually verse two, it says, for we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did. But the message they had was of no value to them because those who had did not combine it with faith. 
Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said, so I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. So it still remains that some will enter that rest and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience, which if you remember is unbelief. Therefore God again set a certain day calling it today when a long time later he spoke through David as was said before today, if you, had, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. The issue of hardening the heart is the issue of unbelief. You know, if you hear the word of God and you harden your heart, it's of no value to you. Why? Because you have taken the path of unbelief. It's like that seed that falls on hard rock or hard soil. Sometimes, you know, if it's in hard soil, it will take root, but it will never really go deep. And so when the issues of the world come, it just withers and dies. The one that falls on the rock is actually snatched away by the evil one. We have to make sure that if we are telling somebody about the Lord, we are really praying against the spirit of unbelief. You know, it's, it's interesting how all this started. We're talking about entering the prayer room you know, with the oil of joy, knowing that the angels are ministering to us. You know, we looked at, um, or, you know, serving, because we, we are heirs of God and heirs with Christ, you know, we inherit salvation. We inherited salvation the moment we accepted Christ. So the angels are there as well to hear our, um, our prayers for as long as they align with the word of the Lord. We talked about in chapter two, how we must pay attention to what we had because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. That's Romans 10, 17. We spoke about how Jesus overcame you know, he has the authority and because he has the authority, we have the authority as well, but it came at a price. So we cannot misuse our authority by not using our authority. Then we talked about how we are part of his family. You know, that was verse 11. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. So we have the right to actually approach the Lord because we are his children and because we have accepted the Lord as our, um, we have accepted him as our Lord and savior. So we can approach God. And then we talked about overcoming death. If he overcame death, so did we. We have him in our hearts. And then we finally enter this whole topic of rest. It's important to know who you are in God. This is what Auntie Edna always tells us. Know who you are in God. The rest they speak of here is your relationship with God. When you enter the prayer room, make sure your relationship with God is right. In other words, your prayer room is what keeps it going. It's what keeps your relationship going. It's what keeps you thriving in the promised land. Why? Because the promised land is all about relationship with God. And relationship with God equals eternal life, which means the more I seek the Lord, the more I have eternal life because eternal life is all about knowing God. Yes, it's a, you live long, even after death, even after you've fallen asleep, you live long. But eternal life was always, always about knowing God because God always prioritized relationship. Finally, we're going to look at verse 16. Actually, let's just start from verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, who has, in fact, just not finished to change this because I want to read it in this other version. Just 
just a moment. Let me see Hebrews chapter four. Okay, so Hebrews chapter four, I'm reading in the NASB. Oh, good, it's not working. Just a moment, just a moment. All right, so Hebrews chapter four from verse 14, I'm reading from the NASB. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold first our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I don't know, you know, what these verses that we've read today may mean to you, but I want to be able to approach God's throne of grace with confidence that I may, you know, receive mercy and find grace to help me in time of need. That's what this has all been about protecting our relationship with God, but knowing that we have the tools. And this all rests in the fact that we have rest. And what is that rest? The promised land. And what is the promised land? Relationship with God. That is your promised land. What's the relationship? Knowing God, because knowing God is eternal life. I don't know, there's no better way to say that, but when you're approaching the throne of grace, when you're approaching your prayer room, these are the things that you have in mind. And I'm going there knowing that I know who my heavenly father is. You are a royal priesthood. You are a child of the most high God. You have authority, you have overcome. You are more than a conqueror. Know who you are in the Lord. These are the things that we have been learning. But imagine if you always have that at the back of your mind. No, not at the back of your mind, at the front of your mind, always. You're always just remembering, you know, all that matters in this world is my relationship with God. That's what you, you're always remembering because that's your promised land. We should never be counted among the Israelites or those that disobeyed God because of their unbelief. They did not enter the promised land because they failed to believe. They did not have faith in God even after all they had seen and they missed out. They missed out. God should, ne God should never be just about what can you give me? You know, I'm coming to you because I need this, because I want this, because I need this and, you know, I desire this or um, praying, even if it's about praying for someone else, it should never be about that. There has to be a time where when you come to God and you're praying to God or you're spending time with the Lord, it's all about getting to know him. That is eternal life. That is rest. That is the promised land. Hmm. Well, I don't know what else to say because I don't want to... Um, I don't know. Yeah, please go ahead, brother iPhone. <laughs> I just want to say something about those last three verses that you wrote, uh, that you read. Um, it also, you know, what really sticks out to me is when you talk about relationship, that Jesus walked this earth and that Jesus went through what we went through. And that just um, you know, you have no excuse to be like, well, he's God and I'm me and he can't relate, you know, because he went through this earth, this crazy world that we're in right now and did it without sinning. And, you know, so he really, it just brings that relationship closer that you can't say, well, he doesn't know what I'm going through, you know, and I don't know, um, just makes it even more that he you know, walked the same, you know, the, the race that we're trying to run right now, he, he did it perfectly. You know, he set the example 
set the bar high, but he showed us the way. And that just, you know, just shows more that he's the one that we reach out to, to, to get things right. And to, you know, to have that relationship with, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention that. That's what really sticks out to me about those three verses. Right. Absolutely. You hold family to what, to what you know. I mean, to the faith you profess. I mean, if you know Jesus Christ, you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. The more you continue to read his word, the more you get to know him. Because at the end of the day, he is the word. You know, isn't that interesting, actually? When you look at 12 and 13, you talk up, we read that for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Um, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So verse 12 talks about the word of God. And who is the word? It's Jesus himself. Because John chapter 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So if Jesus is the word, and it says here, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold family to the faith we profess, then, hmm, let me see if I can put this correctly. If Jesus is the word and you have faith, as in you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then doesn't it also make sense that Jesus becomes your faith as well? You know, in a manner of speaking, you hold family to him. You hold family to Jesus Christ because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So when you're hearing the word of God, you're hearing Jesus himself. Jesus is sharper than a double-edged sword. I don't know if you've read um, the first few chapters of Revelation I took, where he appears to the church. And in one of the, I think it's in Revelation 1, where there's a sword, you know, coming out of his mouth. He is the word. And while he's there to comfort you and hold you, He's also there to correct you and make you look in the mirror and say, am I like Jesus Christ? Because you are to be holy as he is holy. But anyway, back to what I was saying, if he is the word, then he is the faith you're also holding on to. Why? Because you know that he went through what you went through. It's just, I mean, I totally agree with what you're saying, Brother iPhone. I mean, we really have no excuse. People, we have no excuse because he went through what we went through. And if he's gone through that, then that should give you more confidence to pray more, to seek him more, to get to know him more. Hmm. to approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God is not so far off that he doesn't know that you have needs, but he wants you to approach him with confidence. For who of you, if your child asks you for bread, you'll give him a stone or a if he asked you for fish, would give him a scorpion. Where is our childlike faith? Where is our relationship with God? Where is our rest in God? Hmm. Rest, peace. One thing I like to do when I'm praying is to always pray Psalm 23 because it always reminds me of how, I don't know, how, how would I say this, a child. It always reminds me to approach him like a child. 
there's a humility about that psalm, you know, especially when you pray, it, you align it with um, the Lord's Prayer. You get to see how they align, you know, together. Psalm 23. So I guess this concludes the Bible study. <laughs> I don't know what else to say, but I don't know if anybody has a, anything to add, please go ahead. And then if anybody has a prayer request, you can pray for, for that before we close because we've done, I think an hour and 53 minutes. So um, yeah, uh, please go ahead. Anybody who would like just to add something or any questions, yeah. If not, then we can just pray. And I, I do to... have a, a prayer request, in, but if somebody has something else first. Okay. If nobody has anything, I do want to pray for healing. Um, you know, I, my granddaughter was born. She's three weeks old today. And a friend of mine who I've never met, but, uh, you know, we're friends on Facebook and we're in a group together and uh, she's really nice kid. Um, she had a daughter that was born the same day and she was born healthy, but um, she's been in, uh, in intensive care, in, in newborn intensive care uh, ever since she was born. So I want to pray for that baby. And I also have another friend who has a, a daughter who's seven years old, who uh, ha has had leukemia for the last three months. And I guess she's not doing too well. So I really want to pray for healing for those for those two children. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really want to see God work in, uh, you know, give. I'm so lucky that my my granddaughter was was born so blessed, not lucky, so blessed by the Lord that I have a healthy, happy grandbaby. And uh, and my brother in law, by the way, is from Burundi. So you might know where Burundi is. Yeah, <laughs> I have an African American baby. Her, her daddy, <laughs> her daddy is African, yeah. and her mother is American. <laughs> That's so, amazing. Uh, isn't that amazing? So well, I have so I much joy in my life. I see <laughs> these other people, and I just, I just want to, I just want to pray for them. So. But uh, if anybody else has anything else before we do that, I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, but if, if nobody minds, I'll start and anybody else who wants to pray for them can jump in right after. Okay. I guess, I guess that's all. Um, I don't think. I guess we're oh, going to go ahead, Fred. Oh, oh, okay. Um, just I, I added here, I, I, just to even your your uh, prayer for uh, your children there in your family reminded me too uh, the Bible study that I was at this morning. We were all talking about the need for prayer in for children in general, with all the stuff that's going on and how they're coming under attack with this gender mm -hmm. stuff all these dark forces. So we do want to keep them in our prayer. And just a, another quick thing too, just to keep Edme in prayer. I, I uh, yeah. you know, I don't know if she's traveling today, Rebecca, uh, or if she had to, you yeah. know, to go because of some of the other things that, you know, she had to travel back for, but uh, we want to keep her in, in prayer as well. Yeah, absolutely. She should be traveling today from what I know. I guess we'll see. Because, um, yeah, when she called me, she was uh, preparing for all of that because then it had, uh, with, you know, with her family. And uh, I think she had mentioned earlier that her nephew was coming over. So she had to, you know, take care of him. And also, I really, I, yeah, she should be traveling today, I think. So definitely to keep her in prayer. Um, anything else? Maybe there was a lady. Previously, I don't know what her name was, but the last prayer meeting we had, she had, she was on oxygen. I just, I'm so sorry, I can't remember her name. Um, I just hope she's okay. 
Oh Lord, what is her name? Well, I just don't remember her name, but uh yeah. Was it you? It was you. You were in Oxygen and Auntie Edme prayed and you um you took off that um oh my goodness. How are you doing? Are you okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Oh um yes, I'm I'm on oxygen um basically um most of the day I have to have it. Um now I mean amen. I've um had better oxygen, natural oxygen use. I don't have to uh sit with it as mm. much as I usually have to. So there's a lot of improvement. So, you know, thank all of you who prayed for me and, and who was praying for me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I do believe that, you know, that I, I'll be better. One day I won't need it anymore. I do believe that. Amen. 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 Hmm. I'm so happy to hear that. God answers prayer. I mean, that is definitely a step in the right direction. Absolutely. I can't wait to see you jumping <laughs> without it, for sure. It's something that's <laughs> gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Um, anybody else? I guess I, I, would, I would want to put that on the prayer list if that's okay. Absolutely, yeah. please. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, I guess. Is that all? Any other prayer requests? Okay, I guess that's all. Okay, so who will pray for who? Oh, um, I see uh, Miss Donna and Miss Barb and this HT, do you have any prayer requests or we could go ahead, we can go ahead and, uh, and pray. I hope you're all okay. None for me, thank you. That says okay. Barb. Okay. All right, then we shall go ahead. So who is going to pray for um, Auntie Edme, and then for Brother iPhone, then the the child. Um, Brother iPhone, um, if um, is it okay to mention the name of the child in intensive care, and then the one with leukemia? Um, I don't remember her name. Uh, but I'm. I'll pray for. I'll just pray for her. Her mother's. Her mother's name is Jill Jones. And oh, okay. uh, I I don't remember the name. I'd have to look it up on my phone where I can't do that when I'm on Zoom. I don't know how. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's the same with uh, with my other friend. I, I'll pray for Terrence's daughter. I don't know uh, her. I don't remember her name either. I I have it somewhere, but I don't have it in my in my head, unfortunately. But okay. uh, can I no, can I good. pray for them, and then anybody else who wants to mention them can can certainly pray for them as well. Oh, absolutely! And you know, just to the issue of leukemia, uh, we had a child just recently. This lady, you know, because I just want to tell you because you know, faith comes by hearing, and hearing the word of God. And this was a testimony. There was um. A child, uh, just uh, in this, I could say in the same area, I wouldn't say in the neighborhood, but maybe some distance away. And um, this lady, mother of this child, had asked support from her family to help treat the child because the child had leukemia. And they didn't know that the child had leukemia. It was something, you know, one day the mother, the child is breathing funny you know, just weak and all. And, you know, she told the child has leukemia. And so she asked the family to raise money and all of that. And my gosh, 
they just couldn't afford it. I mean, whatever was raised was 1% of the amount actually needed to treat the child because they had to go to India for the medical expenses, you know, and then you tie in where, the, where will they be staying, you know, food, water, I mean, all of these things, the necessities of life, and I just couldn't afford it. And so there was a pastor, you know, they went and this woman went to the, to the pastor and said, now apostle, okay, actually should they call him apostle? <laughs> so um, apostle, I have nothing left. I have no money. I have, I have nothing. I can't help this child. I can't take him to the hospital. Even our local hospitals here, I can't afford that. My own family has failed to raise money to help my child. The only solution is, as I was told, is that I have to, because she had two kids. So one had to give I said, a bit of a bone marrow to the other child. And the woman asks herself, but how can I risk my healthy child for my sick child? So she's caught in between and she's like, now apostle I'm torn. There's nothing I can do. Apostle is like, let us pray. That's all he did. He's like, let us pray. And he prayed. And three months later, when I tell you, they took the kid for a checkup. Kid is fine. I mean, he he's playing. I don't think what's gonna express. I, I just want to cry because you you see a child who was dying, but they are alive, like a normal child. There's no leukemia nowhere. I mean, it's one of those things where the doctors are like, well, this is nothing short of a miracle. This is definitely a miracle. So that's just encouragement to anybody out there. God still answers prayer. We can beat this thing. I mean, there's nothing impossible for God. There's nothing impossible for God. So we're going in here with the oil of joy because we know if he did it before, we can do it again. That's right. That's right. Amen. And this girl, just to give you a little background, she's nine years old and she's like a little warrior. You know, she's going through the chemo and all that. And it's just so sad to see. And she's mm -hmm. trying to keep a brave face and everything. But, you know, I just I just. I know God can take it away. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that's my prayer. Like you said, he, he did it and he can do it again. So yeah, let, let's, let's pray for her and also for, um, Jill Jones's little, little baby, just brand new into this world. So yeah, I'll, I'll get right into it. Uh, Father God, first of all, we, we just come to you and we thank you. We thank you for everything. We thank you for Jesus dying on the cross for us. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for all the blessings. And we thank you for this relationship that we have with God, where we can come to you and ask you for these things we need. In Jesus' name, God, I ask you to please take care of Terrence's little warrior. You know, she has leukemia. Please put your hands on her and take that from her. Please, Lord Jesus, I ask for healing for this little girl. And Lord Jesus, I wanna ask that you be with Jill Jones's brand new little baby girl. She's three weeks old today, born the same day as my granddaughter. And thank you again, thank you again for my granddaughter's health. And you know, thank you for the blessings that you put on my family. But Lord Jesus, I just, I feel so bad for Jill and her little baby. I, I want to ask you to please heal them. I want them to see a miracle, Lord Jesus, in your name. And please help, I, you know, all of us on this call are coming together in your name. I'm praying, praying for this miracle, but it says in your word to heal the sick. And that's what I'm doing right now. That's what we're doing with faith, Lord Jesus. I want to see these children healed in your name. Amen. Thank you, Father. Amen. Father, I Lord, we want... thank you. Just a moment. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, okay. Now, when you're praying, you, you when you are praying, uh, uh, what, what was it? Lord, protect, uh, protect this child. Um, look after 
was it Jill John's child and Terence's child, right? Now, what I want you to do is to take the authority you have because Christ lives in you and decree and declare over these children healing because you have the power to do that. Hmm? You have the power to do that. Decree and declare healing over those children. All right, let me try again. So, Lord, G all right, let me see. How do I want to say this? So, Lord Jesus, I say with faith, these children are healed in your name. These children are healed in your name. Please, Lord Jesus, I declare these children to be healed in your name. Jill's little baby is healthy. She is healthy. She is healthy. No more doctors. You're the, you're the doctor. You have healed this baby. Lord Jesus, Terrence's daughter, no more leukemia for her. She's fought hard enough. Now we see the glory of God. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for the coaching. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm learning as well. So <laughs> remember to include some scripture in there, you know, just to help you. Sometimes when you have nothing to say, your life by 39 stripes of the Savior Jesus Christ. She is healed. Jill John's child is healed. I mean, mm. keep that thing out. Hmm. Okay. Let's go ahead. Brother Fred, you wanted to pray? Yes. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Jesus, for everyone on this call, Lord, and thank you that we can gather here in your name. We thank you for all the blessings you've given us, your salvation, Lord Jesus, the power that you've given us that oftentimes we don't use, that we need to use and just rest in you, your rest, Lord. So we declare too the prayer requests, we declare safe travel for Edme. She, she moves about and, and goes through some of the things that I know she's up against. Lord, we also declare that you would hold back evil and help us, as we declare, to push back against evil for all the things that are happening to children around the world, and especially mm -hmm. here in the West, things that are coming up against them, Lord. We say this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, Amen. Amen. Uh, um, Mr. Okay, anyone was, would like to pray for Miss Yolanda, or I'll, I'll pray for her. Is that okay? All right, I guess I'll pray. Okay, let's humble ourselves and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come before you this day. Once again, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for all that you've provided. Thank you that where two or three are gathered, there you are in our midst. Thank you that we have the keys, that we are more than conquerors, oh Lord, that whatever you ask, we ask for in your name, oh Lord, you have answered, we have it. We say, ask, seek, knock. Lord, we have all the things that we need. We just have to start using them. You have anointed us with the oil of joy. You have surrounded us, O oh Lord, King of glory, with everything that we need. We know that the angels are hearing us, O oh Lord, even as we pray. They are carrying out your commands, your will, because your word does not return void, O oh Lord, King of glory. Lord, I commit to Miss Yolanda into your hands. Father, your word has said that by 39 stripes of our Savior, Jesus Christ, she is healed. Father, Lord, you are her oxygen. You are all she needs. Father, when she's in your presence, it is all about you. There's nothing else she needs but you. I decree and declare healing over her in the name of Jesus Christ. She's going to be jumping. She's going to be singing. She's going to be running. She's going to be walking in the name of Jesus Christ. No more oxygen tubes. No more of that. Oh, Lord. 
all that stuff, O oh Lord, King of Glory, we decree and declare healing over her because she's going to breathe in the oxygen the Lord gives her, God's oxygen in the name of Jesus Christ, the oxygen of the environment. She's going to enjoy long walks in the forest in the name of Jesus Christ, long walks along the sidewalk, wherever it may be. She's just going to be healthy and strong and everything is going to be working in her body as it is supposed to in the name of Jesus Christ, because your precious blood flows through her body. Lord, you did not go and die on the cross for nothing. You died that people may be healed. You are Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah, our healer. I decree and declare that because it is not I who live, and it is not Miss Yolanda who lives, but you who lives in her, she is healed as she is a walking testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. I decree and declare healing over her right now in the name of Jesus Christ. By the time we meet next, there's going to be even a greater testimony. I also pray, O oh Lord, trying to add my protection because no weapon formed against her will prosper. Father, I pray that you take her and bring her back home safely, that everything she sets her hand to do, she will accomplish in the name of Jesus Christ, she will succeed. Father, I decree and declare that you protect the children in our world. I pray, O oh Lord King of God, that you protect their minds, you protect their brains, you protect their bodies, O oh Lord. Each and every single part of them is healthy and whole. I pray, O oh Lord, that whatever forces of darkness our enemy has sent, O Lord, King of glory, it will not prosper because no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And these are your children. And you said, let the little children come to me. Father, no one has a right to touch your children because you protect them and you watch over them. So I pray, O Lord, that, whatever, that wherever the forces of darkness are, they are dispelling because the children are the light, O Lord, wherever they are, they have Jesus. Let the parents teach them about Jesus that wherever they go, they're the city on a hill, they're the salt of the world, they're the light of the world, oh Lord. I decree and declare that they are protected, that your angels continue to surround them and watch over them in the name of Jesus Christ, because no weapon from against them will prosper. And I decree and declare that even where things have gone wrong, where children have been taught horrible things or they have seen horrible things, oh God, that you are cleansing their minds that you know that their minds are cleansed that they're being transformed by the renewing of their minds oh god that they know jesus christ and they know how much he loves them that they are being changed from the inside out and becoming who you have called them to be because the little children are yours oh lord yours now i pray oh lord for ginger's child and i pray Lord, you said that you knew us before we were formed in our mother's womb. You knew this child before she was formed in her mother's womb. And so I decree and declare healing over this child. No weapon formed against her will prosper. What was meant for her harm, oh Lord, you will turn for her good in the name of Jesus Christ. I decree and declare that that child is going to come out of that place healthy and whole. She is whole and healthy in the name of Jesus Christ because she is a child of the most high God and she, the work that you began in her, you will see it to completion. She is going to do every single thing that you called her to do in this world. I pray the same prayer for Teresa's child, oh Lord, that you will touch that body Oh Lord, through your supernatural power, I decree and declare that she is healthy and whole, that oh Lord, your angels indeed carry out your word because it does not go empty, it does not return void, oh Lord. That child is touched and healed in the name of Jesus Christ. We stretch forth our hands healing over these children, oh God. May Terence's child walk out of that place. No more chemotherapy, no more um, leukemia, oh Lord. As Brother iPhone was saying, that you are the doctor, you are the ultimate doctor, oh God, because you're Jehovah Rapha. You be everything that they need. May your precious blood flow through their veins, the blood that brings, that brings healing, because you did not die for nothing, oh God. You said by 39 stripes, said that Jesus Christ, we are healed. I decree and declare healing over those children. They are healthy and whole in the name of Jesus Christ. And now I pray, oh Lord, for whatever need has not been placed on this phone call, whether it is financial, whether it is having to do with family relationships or work issues, whatever it may be, Lord, your word says that each heart knows its own pain and each heart knows its own joy. 
So I pray that you meet everyone at their point of need because you have also said that you provide all our needs according to your grace and glory. You are our Father and you take care of us, oh God. Let us use what you have given us. Let us remember your word. Let us remember that you are, are always our goal, our goal, that you are our promised land in the name of Jesus Christ, that to know you is better than anything, that, we, that to seek you and find you is better than anything. Father, in each and every single thing that we do, may we always look for you and protect our relationship with you and find rest in you and find peace in you, O oh Lord. Let your name be glorified. And even as we go back, O oh Lord, into our lives, let us always remember, O oh God, who you are, that eternal life is to know you, O oh God. Let us remember to have faith. Let us remember that you are everything that we could ever need in the best of circumstances and in the worst of circumstances. Thank you that you have given us peace and strength to face each and every single trial, each and every single tribulation. For in this world, we will have tribulation, but we have to be of good cheer because you have overcome. John 16, 33. And if you have overcome, we have overcome because we are more than conquerors, as it says in Romans 8. Thank you that you've had this prayer, my Lord and my God. Thank you, Daddy God that you are there forever and always, that you are the center of it all. Thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross and that is a price we cannot take for granted. Let us not misuse it, but let us always remember that you paid a heavy price for us to be able to approach the throne of grace with confidence, to have the authority that we have, but more importantly, to have relationship with the Father, to restore, as Brother Iphone was saying earlier, and Brother Fred, I think it was that about the Garden of Eden to restore that relationship that we had. Thank you that you did that because now here we are seeking your face, calling on your name, and you have already answered. We walk out of here in faith, believing that everything we have asked for in your name, you have answered. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the oil of joy, for the strength, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. Thank you for peace and sense of understanding throughout this week. In the name of Jesus Christ, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Good job, Rebecca. Thank you. you. Good tonight. Oh, God. I Thank you like very much. You. You're welcome. <laughs> God bless you all. Thank you, Thank you God for God bless you me. all. Yes. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. Good night, everyone. Good night. See you Good soon. Good night, Fred. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. See you, Jay. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.